on the latest episode of the PCT podcast, we're absolutely delighted to be joined today by today's guest, who has a range of experience, wealth and knowledge in the game of football. And so without further ado, welcome Juan. How are you, my friend? Hi, Martin. How are you? Thank you for the invitation to your podcast. Not a problem, mate. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to get you on. And I just want to start really by asking for those who may be unaware um, of what it is you're doing at the minute. Can you give us a brief insight into your current roles? As I know you're a very busy man. Yes, well, at the moment I'm working with Walsall Football Club with the youth development phase as a part-time coach. Uh, also, I work with the University of Warwick as mainly the, the first team manager of the university, but also uh, I try to coordinate all the teams. We've got four teams in uni. Um, uh, I'm, because I'm doing a master's right now, I also have the opportunity through the master's of working as a performance analyst for Older Chot Town, uh, the first team in the National League. And I'm also first team manager at Smedic Rangers, so non league football step six. So, yeah, basically, those are the roles that I'm doing right now in football. <laughs> <laughs> a, a very busy man, and, and, it, and it sounds like you're, you're very much like any coach looking for you know that path in the game of taking multiple roles. And some, something that I, I want to start off with how do you find the time to fit all that in? Well, <laughs> sometimes there's no time. <laughs> 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 no, but uh, normally, what I try to do when I get these this different roles is, is first to check if. If, if I will get the time to do them and if, if it's possible to combine the, the schedule between, bo between all of them because, uh, I mean, for example, the, the role as performance analyst uh, with older shot, I mean, the club is based almost three hours away from home. Yeah. So it's not really for me or wasn't really for me realistic to get that role if I needed to go there every single day, mm -hmm. but they gave me the opportunity to work from home. So uh, the good thing is I work with the, with the clips. I, sometimes I go to some of the matches when they are nearby home, meaning less than two hours, mm -hmm. um, just to watch some games live. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I try just to make sure those uh, commitments won't clash with each other. And I will be able to give my my 100% to each role because I don't want to take roles then say no sorry I can not do it now because it makes no sense. I mean, there's when you say yes, it's because you know you are able to do it. So yeah, it's just trying to find the way we could work together. And and, and with that one, has has there been any roles that you've possibly maybe wanted to get and I mean had to sort of turn it down through gritted teeth because of because of other commitments? Uh, well, yes, I, I, I've seen roles that I said, mm, I like that, but I know if, if I wanted to go for that, I needed to say no to different things. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where probably decision making <laughs> uh, comes, comes alive and, and you say, okay, fine. I mean, uh, what do you really want as a coach at this moment in time? And, and, and what, is, what I think is best for me as a coach at this moment to get a different role. So uh, I think at the moment with the roles I got, I got a good blend of, of, uh, of responsibilities that are completely different to each other because one is youth football in a, in, a, in a professional academy. Then one is, is uni football, which is completely different. The mindset, the hours in training, the training times. Then you got non-league football that is another different beast, completely different. And then obviously performance analysis in a, in a team that plays national league. It, it, they are all completely different. So for me, that's a good plan. So, just just decide just to decide to leave one of them for something that is not going to bring me any any growth as a coach is hard to take 
So th that's why I try to be na nowadays a bit selective wh where where to apply. Yeah. And and you mentioned there, like, like I say, the roles that you do have four roles currently at the minute, and and it is a wide range of sort of experiences. Was that done on purpose, or or, or was that yes. something that just came together? Uh, well. <laughs> Obviously, sometimes you need to be lucky to get these roles, obviously, because I mean, I, there are many people applying for this type of roles. Uh, but yes, I, I, I try to combine these roles in that way. So I got the experience of youth football, I got the experience of senior football. Uh, uni football was something that I was really interested in, in trying and see how it was because I mean, not not having my education here in England, I didn't know what to expect really from uni football. So, uh, but I have I I started in September 2019, so it has been one year on the roll, and I really love the the uni football because yeah. uh, the players are really really easy to work with. Uh, even that they have their mind in getting a degree in, at uni, they love their football. And, and, and they are really committed. Training is at seven o'clock in the morning and they are always there. So uh, it's, it's, it's really good because it's also trying to build a culture in uni, in those four teams. And I think for players that are really getting a degree in uni, having this commitment and this discipline in something that is not related to their degree is really good for their development as a person. So trying to be part of that is really good because obviously at the end, it's, it's, I want them to have fun when they play because at the end, we know they are not going to be professional players. They do it because they love to play. But at the same time, you need to give them a bit of discipline because if not, it could go completely wrong. And obviously the, the, the university have expectations in the program. Uh, so it's, it's really good because they know they are not going to be professionals. They know that's not going to be their jobs, but they are always there and they are willing to get better, which is the main thing that you can ask as a coach is committed players and also coachable wanting to, to be better. So. Yeah, it's, it's, to be honest, working with there is, is, is really, really good. Really good. We, we, we spoke off air before, before we sort of started recording this conversation that, you know, the current situation that might lead to a bit of frustration in terms of training and games being called off. How it, it impresses me and it, it really, you know, stands out for me that these university players that you, you're saying you're coaching are, are very committed to getting up and, and training at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, yeah. That must be a massive, massive sort of boost for you as a coach. Yes, I mean, uh, I think when you coach, you have a, a two-way relationship. Obviously, you need to motivate the players as a coach, but you also need to find motivation from the players. And the motivation that you want as a coach is commitment and hard work from them. Uh, because when you have a group of players that you know they're going to be there, when you have a group of players that you know they really want to play and they really want to learn and they really want to improve, you cannot ask for some, some for something more. Mm -hmm. So obviously for me, it's not a sacrifice to go there at seven o'clock in the morning and work with them even even during winter. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, 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 that is really amazing. And I'm, I'm talking about the pandemic really is uh, during the, the second lockdown, uh, and I'm going to give you an example of the difference between non-league football and these uni players is uh, both of them had a fitness plan, both groups. And I had to chase more the non-league players while the uni players, they, we se they, they were sending me each week what they did. And, and some of them, they were, for example, one of the things that they were just tracking was 5K, uh, 5K runs. Mm -hmm. And you could see how they improved their time in two weeks. Wow, okay. So uh, 
and 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 again, it's 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 surprising that they put that that amount of commitment, knowing that there's no a career in football for them, or they don't think about a career in football for them, but they put the sacrifice to to get better. That that's quite interesting for me, and you know, please excuse my ignorance in this. Do, do you have a budget for your your non-league side? And do, do no, players get not. paid no. So. Okay, that's interesting then that you've got guys who are who are doing it as and, and I'm not saying non league isn't isn't a hobby and for fun, but you know, you've got guys who know that or maybe have no aspirations to go further in the game but are are committed to improving themselves. Whereas you're saying there it, you found it quite um sort of frustrating and difficult to motivate your, your non league players. I think I think that's it's interesting for me. And 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 how as coaches can we can we help motivate those players? Because look, look, we're we're in the middle of a, a global pandemic, yeah. and you know there's more important things than football uh, that could be argued. But you know, how how do we help players at the minute to to maintain that love for the game because it's been decimated by this this pandemic? Yeah, it's, uh, I I think it's tough, and it's tough also for us as coaches to find a way to to keep them engaged because. Uh, Obviously, for example, the non-league players, the majority of them are hard-working people, that they have their own family, they, they are busy during the whole day. And, and especially now during winter, that the day is so short, asking them to go for a run at 7 o'clock after work when they are completely knackered mm-hmm. uh, and it's really cold outside, it's, it's, it's hard to... to um, to demand for them, but on, yeah. on the other hand, it's okay. Say okay, fine. They cannot do it because there are good reasons not to do it every day. So how can we approach this? So instead of probably asking them, I don't know, four or five times a day, okay, whenever you got time, send me what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also try to do some uh, Zoom calls and 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 discuss about tactics. And, and that went really well because uh, at the end, uh, the coaching staff of the team, we didn't really talk. We, we, we split the groups, the team in different groups, and we gave them a tactic. Mm-hmm. A formation. So let's say this group have a 4-3-3 formation to discuss this group have a 3-5-2. And then what we wanted really is to tell us pros and cons of each formation, but try to putting in perspective to our team okay. and, and how they think uh, that formation might work or it might not work for our players. So it, it was really interesting because it was a really good discussion that I wasn't sure how, how it was going to develop because, as I said, they are busy guys, uh, but it, it worked really well. So, uh, and, and they had at least the time to discuss football, have a bit of fun, even that it was a Zoom call, and, and try to do something together as a team. So, it's, it's finding different ways to try to stick together during these difficult times. And it's not only related to, now just go outside, run, do some fitness and let me know. Uh, so, finding different ways to, to stick together. And, and I think also is, Check on them, uh, see how they are, drop them a message, give them a phone call, just to make sure they are fine. If they want to talk, great. Let's have a chat about anything, uh, because at the end we need to. They are not footballers. We are persons. That's it. We are human beings, and we are suffering this pandemic in in different ways. We have different realities. So I think right now it's more checking how you are as a person. And then we can start discussing about football. So I love that one. I, I love the fact there that you've, you've mentioned that you, you know you've got the forefront of the players' well-being. You know, it, it's all well and good us as coaches putting these demands to maintain levels of fitness, but there's bigger things going on. And, and I think one one thing I'd ask, and, and you know, I'm sure you would agree, is that socially, and in, in terms of social aspects, that will benefit you more as a coach by having those Zoom calls than asking players to have ownership and do 5K runs and workouts. Yeah, 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 completely. Because 
it, it, it gives you something different. It gives you something different and, and probably, I don't know, if, if you could ask them, they might have a different view of the Zoom call, but, but I know the majority of them enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know when they start discussing between each other and you as a coach, just, just, you are allowed to just sit back and listen to them. You say, okay, fine, it's going well. They are doing this whole discussion without us, the coaches, need to intervene. So that, that's, that's yeah. really good. And at the end, you, also what you want as a coach is you, you want players to have game understanding. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they need to be fit. Yes, of course. They need to be good technically, yes. But if they don't, they don't understand the game, it's, it's more difficult for you as a coach to talk about tactics or talk, to talk about, okay, we're going to do this in possession, we're going to do this out of possession, transitions, whatever. If they don't see the game, it's, it's, it's tough. So that's why we decided to go that way about talking about formations and tactics to also, from our coach's point of view, is to see, okay, who understands the game better in this group of players? and who we need to play, pay more attention of saying, okay, probably this player in particular is not really understanding what he needs to do. So we need to put more attention on him when we come back. So it, it was also an exercise for us to understand, okay, who are the clever guys in terms of, of football brain? Uh, so it, it was really, really useful. And then, and again, you're touching on there, knowing, knowing the person behind the player and and vice versa, which, you know, for those that know you, one, you're destined for big things in the game. And one, one thing I want, I want to move on to is, is how you got to where you are now, because there's an interesting backstory to, to this. And, you know, my first question is, is, is when did the love affair with football begin? Did, well, did, you, did you start playing at a young age? Yes, I, I started playing when I was four years old. Uh, and it, to be honest, it wasn't my parents, apparently, and obviously I don't remember this. My mother told me that just one day walking just outside the school, I saw a group of, of boys playing football. And I just said to her, that's what I want to do. So, uh, okay. and, and she said, do you really want to do that? Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. I don't I not even know what the name was. And, and she <laughs> said, okay, fine, we'll get you there. It wasn't that I asked, I, I mean, it wasn't my parents that put me in. It was just a coincidence, I don't know, but yeah, that was how it happened. Uh, my mother loved football, well, loved watching football, to be honest. Uh, and she, for, for example, she, she, she tells me that when I was born in 1981, so the first World Cup was Spain 82. Obviously, less than one year, no memories at all so uh, but she used to watch the whole game the, the whole world cup and she put me just in front of the tv like to see if, if i was going to watch it obviously i didn't care but probably those those little messages was getting inside me to to play yeah so i started playing at four uh, and i stopped for a bit when i was 20 uh, for a couple of years. Uh, that's, that was while I was in uni for, well, the last year of uni, I had it to stop. Uh, some injuries and, and then commitment at uni, I couldn't, I couldn't carry on. Uh, and then I, I got back again until, and I stopped playing when I was 32, yeah, 32. So yeah. yeah, quite quite a long love affair. When when was it that you then first got into coaching? Then was it during during your sort of break from playing, or or was it? I was always interested in coaching, and I remember since I was eighteen, I always said, mm, I, I mean, I knew way before eighteen years old that I wasn't going to play professional football, but it was always in in the back of my head, like, oh, I would like to do some coaching. Not, not even as a, as a full-time job at that moment. I was just thinking of a way to stay in the game in a different way. But it, it, never, it never happened while I was living in Venezuela, to be honest. 
uh, I used to have good conversations with my different coaches about tactics, a uh, way of playing, things like that. But I never really did like a training session or anything like that. So when I moved to England uh, almost seven years ago now, uh, I had the chance. I mean, I was one day at, at, at home and I and I saw this advertise about a, a nonary wood cult. They are they are based in Worcester, mm -hmm. and and they were looking for someone, a coach to level one coach, to run one of the development centers, and that was mainly boys from four to six year olds, um, training on a Saturday morning. So I said, okay, I didn't have the level one by that moment. So I, I called the guys, uh, um, um, and the guy in charge, Darren Mays, uh, had the interview with me and said, okay, you have a, a decent uh, background of playing football. So for these boys, I think you're going to be more than enough. But obviously he said, well, we need you to get the level one. I said, okay, fine, no problem. So I, I just got into the level one. And, and since then, I'm, at that moment, you had the chance, and, and probably when you do your level one or level two, you had the chance of going directly to the level two, mm -hmm. and level one was part of the level two. But when I did it, I decided to go only with the level one because I wasn't sure about coaching. I mean, I wanted to do it, but I wasn't sure how I was going to react about coaching. And I wasn't sure if I was going to really enjoy coaching the way I enjoy playing. So I said, it's, it's not point to the level two straight away, just to the level one that is just two weekends, see how you feel and then decide. And I love it. I love it. And, and since then it has been, uh, it's, it's non-stop. I mean, you go to bed thinking about coaching, you wake up thinking about coaching and, and things that you could do to make it better or things that you can do as a coach to make you better. So uh, it has been non-stop since I started seven years ago. And so on, that, that's quite a journey from, from taking a, a role, you know, on a Saturday morning with, with four to six year olds, not as a level one and, and now, these four roles and studying on the A license, that, that's quite a meteoric rise. Is it, has it been a bit of a whirlwind journey or is it, has it passed? Eh, well, it, it has been, this year has gone really quick, to be honest, and, and, and really thinking about, I, I was talking with my wife last night about when I started doing those little boys, and it's amazing that it has been now since uh, seven years since I started that role, and and I, I look back and I think probably without that role, I couldn't be where I am right now. Mm. So uh, for me, that, those little boys were the trigger to me to get, yes, do this. Do it because it's, it's what you love. At the end, it's, it's the game that you love. It's, it's what you want to be involved all the time. So they were the trigger that I really needed to probably where I am right now. So, so dipping your foot then in, into coaching in that role, can, can you remember your first session and how it went? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it, it was more like a technical session. I mean, we used to have 10, 12 boys in that session. So I said, well, they need to have the ball. They need to love this little thing for the rest of their life. So let's make something that is fun for them. So it was more a technical a session where they have a lot of ball with them, a lot of ball time with them, and, and just have fun as, as, a, as a group of players. And it, it was really funny because things like, okay, uh, you're going to run with the ball, pass to a teammate, but then a uh, high five, then come back to the next cone. So it was more like a bit of that relationship between the players, but also having the technical bits inside there. And, uh, I mean, if, if it was a really, really simple session. Uh, probably if, if any top coach look at that, say, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at the end, the boys were just smiling. They were laughing. They were enjoying the session. 
So uh, for me, it was was uh, nothing better, nothing better than that. I mean, see, seeing the players just having fun, especially at that age, that it's just fun. They just need to love being there. Yeah. So it, it was it was amazing. It was amazing. What what I'm keen to to try and draw out as well, one is you you've grown up in Venezuela, you know, uh, playing the game that that you love. You come to England seven years ago and, and then get into coaching the game that you love. What differences have you seen in terms of the way Venezuela views football and the way that England views football? Well, I, I think there's some massive difference. I mean, England is the home of football, no doubt about that. You go to each corner, you find a football pitch, but you find a football club. Uh, and uh, I was discussing this with my father the other day. And I say it's, it's crazy to see teams in National League that they have better facilities than teams in the first division in Venezuela. So, uh, obviously, it, it's a cultural shock in terms of even that I, I love football and since I was four that the amount of facilities, the amount of teams, the amount of people playing football is crazy here. It's crazy. Uh, we, we, I think we share the love of the sports between baseball, basketball, and football. Those are the three main sports in Venezuela. Uh, and yes, football has been growing up uh, a lot in the last 30 years. In, in the country, especially I would say a good era was the end of the 90s was a good era for Venezuela. Venezuela was economically fine as a country, so there was a lot of support for, from private investors for the national team and the, and the teams in the first division. So that helped the, 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 the sport to grow a lot. Uh, unfortunately, with the political situations, and I don't want to go there, obviously, uh, it is it, not the same. So even that there are a lot of people working hard to keep the teams progressing and, and, the, um, and, and try to compete in the continental competitions as Copa Libertadores, which is the similar to the Champions League in South America, is tough. It's tough because there are things that are just off the pitch, outside the game, that are affecting the game. Uh, but while I was there, it was, it was a good era, especially when I was uh, 16, 18 years old. Uh, and I was uh, lucky enough to live just next to a public football pitch and a futsal pitch. So if I spent hours and hours of my weekdays and weekends and weekends playing there. And it, it was nice because I probably started playing there when I was 12. And it was non-stop for six, seven years. Every Saturday afternoon, every Sunday morning, you were on that on that on that pitch. And we used to play more futsal. Uh, but it, I mean you could be 12, but you were playing against lads that were 18. Uh, and no rules. I mean, if, if if you call a foul, they could tell you off. No, that's not a foul. So carry on. And because you were the 12 year old, you need to find a way to keep playing. And the thing was, sometimes we had 40, 50 people playing. Not, not obviously not at the same time. It was always five v five. But you had 30, 35 people waiting to play. So you knew if you lose, you probably won't be able to play again today. So you needed to find a way to win your games and stay on, stay on, stay on. Um, because the way you, we used to play, I don't know how they do it here, is either 10 minutes or two goals. So yeah. either you score two goals or the winner after 10 minutes. And that's it. Losers out and another team comes in. So uh, it, it was try to survive every single game and stay on the pitch. <laughs> That's an interesting thing there. Now that you are obviously are coaching the game and coaching the youth of today, 
how how much does that influence your coaching practices? The fact that you know you you mix as a twelve year old against eighteen year olds, and we're told like it or lump it. How does that affect your coaching practice now? Uh, obviously, in terms of academy football, we are restrained by some of the rules, and yes, and and we need to understand some of the rules have a good knowledge behind that. But also we know that there are benefits of playing a player up, playing a player down sometimes, mixing teams. I mean, for example, on Tuesday, we normally share the pitch with the under 12. So one thing that we started to do this season is once a month, we play again, 11 by 11, but we mix the players. So it's, it's just, okay, just find a way, just play together. And I think that's really good, especially, well, I mean, for both teams, because one, as a social uh, activity, you need to now uh, get involved with players that you don't normally get involved. Yeah, you see them every Tuesday, but they are on the other side of the pitch. But now you need to be a teammate of those players. So your communication has to change with them. It's not just hi and that's it. It's, yeah, pass me the ball. And, and it's, it's, it has been really nice because some of the under 12, sometimes they are demanding more from the under 13s. And it's good to see how under 12 are, are not shy to tell an under 13 year old, you need to do this better. <laughs> so uh, I, I think it's important that when possible, to have that interaction or, uh, to play up, to play down, because it gives you things completely different in perspective. Obviously, a 12-year-old playing against an 18-year-old is, 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 is criminal. <laughs> I mean, especially if you do it in, in, inside an academy. But if, if we really think about it, how old was Rooney when he played his first match in the Premier League? He was 15, 16 years old. 16, yeah. So... Uh, if if a player is good enough and 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 we understand that he has the ability to play against older players why not why not i mean obviously you need to start that in training in a very uh, restricted way and see how he copes mainly with the physicality aspect because the main thing is is the physicality aspect, because if he knows how to find his pockets of space, how he can cope with someone being stronger than him, and he's doing fine, okay, why not push the player? Because th that's what you want. I mean, you, you want to push the boundaries of the players if you really want to, to improve them. Because if you got a, a, an under 13-year-old that he's playing up for the under 14, and he is the best in that team. Why not try to play on the on the on the fifteens and see what happens? And then you say, okay, no, probably this is too much after a couple of training sessions. And you know what? No, the boy is doing well. Let's keep him there. And yes, and probably now and then, okay, bring him back to his normal age group and how he can bring those experiences of playing against under 14s, under 15s, back to under 13s. So uh, it, it's, it's tough. It's tough uh, because obviously what you don't want is a player getting injured because he was playing against older lads and, and that they are way stronger than him. But if the ability is there, I always wait, I would say, why not? When you start playing senior football, you're going to play as a 16-year-old and you might play against a, a lad that is 32, 33, and it's massive. And you need to find a way to cope with that. So I, I think for those players that we understand or, and we know they might have the ability to cope, just give it a try. Give it a try and see what happens. Uh, obviously, under this environment that we know is going to be safe, but I, I think it's something that that could be done more. And and, and some academy, uh, some academies do it. To be honest, uh, 
but it's, it's and sometimes I think it's, it's how you deal with the parents of make them understand that probably for a 12 year old it's good to have some training sessions with a 15 year old uh, so uh, it, it's tough I, I, I mean the way we, we used to play in Venezuela and probably Venezuela is not a great example because I mean people would say well how many World Cups have you played on <laughs> Venezuela so none so I get that but at the same time we come from that South American type of players that are players mainly made in the street mm-hmm. uh, that they just survive they they live in environments that they need just to survive and football is a way out and 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 they don't have coaches at some point telling them no you cannot play against someone older no they just play they just play and, and so it, it's tough because i understand we need to follow rules and obviously all these rules have a rational and knowledgeable reason behind them but i think mixing players to players uh, to to other players uh, older is really good it's beneficial when the players are capable of coping with that yeah you, you mentioned there sort of like bumps in the road and you know that 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 stress that they, they ultimately need to to continue to develop and and and, and this is this i'm, I'm going to slide nicely into my my next question here is that it was only until recently um, I found out that that whilst back home in Venezuela, you were you were at the university to study a career in dentistry. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I, stu- I studied dentistry, and well, and I then I moved to Chile to do a postgraduate program in oral and maxillofacial surgery. <laughs> right. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, yes, I mean, if, to be honest, if if, if if I told my dad and my parents when I was 16, 17, finishing school that I just wanted to be a football coach, they would say, get out, get out of the house. You don't have a chance. And, yeah. and, and, and I'm not a parent, but if, if I, now that I'm older and if I really think about our situation in Venezuela and how football is seen in terms of money in Venezuela, I understand that they would say, no chance. You cannot do that. Um, so th- they always try to demand uh, a lot from me in, in, in the academic way. Uh, so uh, why dentistry was more related to uh, my aunt being a dentist and because I was really close to her. Uh, I was between medicine and dentistry, so at the end I, I just went for dentistry, and uh, yeah, but the, the yeah the love of football is always there, and uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so then se- seven years ago, what what went on? What what was that spark that made you go? Do you know what? I'm turning back turning me back on a career that I've studied hard and long for to to come to England and, and, and go for this, this career in, in a relenting industry? If, uh, I, I, well, I think the, the situation back home was a major influence in, in leaving the country and, and moving out. Um, now I, I'm lucky enough that uh, I also got a Spanish passport. So coming to Europe was mm-hmm. easy in terms of being a citizen. So, uh, and I was between Spain and, and England, but at the end I said, well, do you know what? As I said, England is the home of football. Let's go there. And I came to London in 2007. Uh, so in that trip, I was amazed with the amount of football teams. I mean, I came just for 72 hours, but I, I came just to watch football and, and being in London and seeing how many stadiums, how many teams you got, you say, I mean, this is the country that if you ever going to think about football, this is the place to be. Because I mean, England just breathe football. 
is is yeah. non-stop. So that's why at the end I decided, you know what, let's go to England and let's go for it. So yeah, that that was the reason uh, that I came and and obviously that thought behind my head always this is what you love football is what you love football is what you love say well this is the moment I got the perfect excuse I cannot keep living in this country so let's move out and follow your dreams that's a that's a massive leap of faith Ron and and, and for those that that know you as well as sort of I do will know that you've got a relenting passion for learning and, and development was the any difficulties or, or hurdles that you faced when, when you first tried to get into the journey? And was, was there anything that maybe left you with any element of doubt of what have I done? Well, I, I think, and, and I think it's, it's, it's the money when you start. Uh, I, mean, I, I think it's, it's not a secret for any coach or any coach starting this journey that money in, in grassroots football, long league football, and even academy football, if you are not a full-time coach, you need to find another job. So uh, probably that was my major concern when I started. Uh, how can I uh, survive? Uh, so, um, and it's still one of my worries in this industry because it's, it's, it's very competitive. Uh, for one of the hurdles that I probably have found is that I don't know anyone and and like a new kid on the block. <laughs> so, and without any professional uh, football career as a player, it, it, I don't have anything that would say, yes, let's hire him without knowing him. No, no chance. Uh, so, and, and that's when I've been always trying to get as many roles as I can because that gives you networking, that gives you people is going to start talking about you. Obviously now, if you get the roles, you need to do well. So people will say, yeah, I know him and yes, he's good. And that is start to build a reputation behind you. Uh, so yeah, taking four roles, many people will say, you're crazy. Why are you doing that? But at the same time, is, is a calculated risk that yeah. I'm taking because I'm trying to get those relationships in place, but also the hours on the, on the pitch, also the, the experience in different areas to grow as a coach. And, and probably I started late. I, I mean, there are some coaches that they started coaching when they were 16. I started when I when I'm when I was 33, so it's almost the when they get to my age, they have been in the industry 16 years old. Mm. So it's, it's it's a massive difference between them and myself, and obviously not knowing anybody when you get to this country, it make it make it a bit more difficult. So and that's why I'm I'm always go back to to my first experience as a coach here and, and, and the person who helped me the first time, Darren Mace, because again, he gave me the opportunity without a clue who, was, who I was. And I said, yeah, I like the way you are. Let's go for it. And, and then, I mean, when I finished my B license, I always wanted to go into an academy football. And Again, no one knew me, and I applied for the job in, at Walsall. I didn't get it. And, and Rob Williams, who was the head of coaching at that moment at Walsall, he said to me, well, what, what I can offer you right now is, is free academy. Uh, I know you are a B-licensed, but I think this is the best way you can start getting involved in, in, football, in academy football. And at that moment, I was... a uh, working as a scout for Wolves. So okay. I say, okay, do I leave a team, a club like Wolf as a academy scout, mm -hmm. or do I go to Walsall as a pre-academy coach? Mm -hmm. And say, you know what, let's go for it. And, and, he, 
and and I went for it and one month later someone resigned from the under 13 group and he said well I'll give you the chance mm-hmm. and I, and again Rob Williams put me in there uh, and yeah and now it has been two and a half years since I joined Walsall uh, do you know what I find really interesting here one is that you know you mentioned networking and you know you, you've taken an opportunity it was a tough decision I had assumed to come from as I say Wolves Premier League club on the rise as a scout and you know maybe you could have got an opportunity there but an opportunity came calling and, and you took it and and from from what it seems is that you've taken it with both hands and and never looked back how how important is it then would you say that the networking and to take that opportunity uh, that I mean, networking is, is is crucial, and I think it's crucial in any industry, because if you apply to a job, and you've got really two really good two contenders or candidates, probably the balance will go with the person you know, because you already know how he is. So you say, okay, I'm making this decision because I know this person is going to make it. The other one might be even a bit stronger. But because you don't know him as a person, you might, might not want to gamble for someone that you don't know. So obviously networking is, is massive uh, in, in any industry and more in a, in a so competitive industry as football. Uh, and then, I mean, I think you need to gamble in life sometimes to, to really get the opportunities that you want, you need to gamble sometimes. And, and when I say gamble, it's sometimes, you know what, if I need to take a pay cut, but that will drive me to the direction I want, let's go for it. Because uh, I think when you take opportunities, sometimes money shouldn't be priority. Uh, especially when, when we're talking about dream jobs. Or, or to get to where you dream every day to get. Probably m- m- money at the end is, is temporary. <laughs> and, and these opportunities might be the one that take you to the dream job that you always wanted. And, and if we really think about dream jobs, and I, if I ask you about a dream job, the less thing or the characteristic of a dream job, I'm sure you won't mention money. Because it's, 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 at the end, we don't do this for money or we don't want to get to an elite environment because of the money. So, uh, and, and that decision between the yeah, Wolf Premier League is, 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 is improving the club every single day. But really, are you in that position where you really want to be? So that's, that's the question you need to ask as a coach, as a scout. Or, yes, Walsall, League 2 team now, but it's giving you the chance to, my, to probably get to where you want to go. Well, let's go for it. For me, it was, obviously, I, I thought about it one day, but I called Rob the next day and said, yeah, I'm going for it. I'll, I'll, talk, to, uh, I'll talk to Wolves and say I'm gone. Uh, and, and, and I explained to, I mean, to, to the people at Wolf, I explained why. And they were completely fine, no problems. I still talk to them, a good relationship with them. Uh, they, just last, two, two Saturdays ago, we went there with Walsall to play against Wolf on the 13th. And one of them was there that used to work with me. And relationship is really good. So, uh, I, I think also when you take these opportunities, you need to be honest with the people around you and, 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 and not try to play uh, and, and play um, tricky games mm-hmm. with, with, with the people around you. Uh, because if you are honest, they might, they're going to understand why you're taking those, those opportunities. So, yeah, it's, it's not easy sometimes, but again, it's, it's decision-making and, and, and thinking what is best for you as a coach or as a scout or as a professional in life. 
one thing I'm keen to understand is you mentioned you've taken a few calculated risks in terms of, of, of going down this pathway of coaching. Who, who was your support network in that? When, when times might have got tough and, you know, as I mentioned, you're there, you're worrying about, are you, are you going to survive? What support network did you have one and, and, and how did they help you through? Uh, well, uh, since I met Rob Williams at Walsall, he has been a, a massive support. Uh, uh, now, well, I think we talk every single month, but when I have these these problems with decision making, I normally try to give him a call and 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 just listen to his advice. Okay. Uh, then it's up to me to take it or not. But obviously, with someone with more experience than me, you want to to listen to what they need yeah. to say. Um, my wife, a massive support, because uh, I don't know how she can cope with me, to be honest. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, I, I, yeah, do, do, yeah. My wife is if 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 the is the best pillar I got, because uh, even that she doesn't know anything about football. I mean. If, if you ask her who is Pep Guardiola, she will tell you, oh, yes, he's the Real Madrid coach. Oh, my God, no. <laughs> just, 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 just leave it there. So, uh, but uh, she's a smart woman. And at the end, she said, well, is that what you want? Yes. Okay. Why do you ask me then? Go for it. That's it. So, uh, that's, that's the big support that I have, really. Superb. I mean, Touching on, you, you were part of the FA mentoring scheme as well, you know, prior to, to the programme coming to an end. How did you find that in terms of your coach development? Uh, unfortunately, I, uh, I was there only for one year and then they decided to, to stop the programme. So I didn't have too many opportunities to really uh, do my job as a mentor during that year mm -hmm. because different things. Uh, but it gave me another perspective of coaching uh, and the way I coach because trying to help someone to become a better coach, you need to have your ideas very, very clear mm -hmm. uh, as a coach. And, and if, if you talk to someone about planning a session, you really need to understand every point that you're talking to them about planning a session. So, uh, some is 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 amazing how being a mentor can develop your coaching ability as well because it's and it's also learning from the mentees because they might come with sessions or ideas or or a way the way they do things that you say I really like this so there are things that you might take to your own context in terms of coaching so I think that was a, a, an amazing experience. It's a shame that they decided to close it because I think it was doing a lot of uh, good things in terms of, of, of coaching in, in the UK at, at grassroots level. No, I, I agree. And, you know, fingers crossed um, we, we, we get that program uh, yeah. available again after the, the pandemic. I know there is... Um, scope to do that but it, it depends on how damaging this this pandemic is and um, one listen it, it takes an extreme mindset to, to juggle the, the different roles that you've got what is it that, that drives you on to be so relentless in your learning and application it, be successful and uh, and then we come with the what, what success can success mean uh, <laughs> Uh, for me, being successful is is being better every single day. Uh, if 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 I look at my first training session with those boys, and I go back there, I would say you did eighty percent of the session was wrong, probably, but that was the learning process. Mm. What wouldn't be right right now is after seven years of coaching still making the same mistake as seven years ago so 
Uh, for me, it's that. I mean, I need to be better every single day. And these roles, these different roles, push me towards that. Uh, and yes, I'm not going to say that every single session is perfect. No, no way. Uh, I need to learn a lot. I need to develop a lot. Uh, I'm not where near where I want to be in terms of how I coach or uh, the things I do. But it's just being better every single day that drives me. And, and, and I think with football, is, is, is there really a limit? I think there's no limit on the, teams, on, on the things that you could learn, how you can develop, what you can achieve in football. And, and if we go to elite, I mean, we could say, okay, yes, this coach won the Champions League. But there's always something else that you want yeah. to win. So, and there's always something else that you want to, to achieve as a coach, as a player, uh, as a scout. So in any role in football, I think there's no limit. And, and that is something that one of the things that I love about football is there's always something else to learn. There's always a way to improve. There are always little areas that you could become even better. And how you influence people towards this journey. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, the amount of uh, players, the amount of coaches you work with, is, is crazy and you don't know how sometimes you are influencing these people to be better as well. So uh, th that's what really drives me on. I mean, being better. What, what does your average week look like then, one? Because we, we know that you've got four roles. I'm assuming well, it includes a lot of coffee and lack of sleep. I don't like coffee. I don't drink coffee. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, with, with tier four, it's easy. I stay home, I stay home, I stay home. <laughs> no, but no, before this, this, this pandemic, it, it was a busy week. I mean, football was during the seven days. I had something. Uh, I mean, on, on a Monday, normally, early, early, early start with a training session with the uni at 7 o'clock, normally until 9. Then, uh, depending on, on my task with the analysis team, watching some games, doing some analysis, uh, Tuesdays, double session, one with Walsall, and then another one with the Smedic. Uh, Wednesdays is normally match with the uni team. Uh, Thursday, again, double session with Wolves and Anesmedic. Friday, a uh, uni training session. Saturday, normally Saturday morning, depending, is either free or go and watch under 21s, football, things like that. More for recruitment for the non-league team. Uh, and then match in the match in the afternoon and Sunday match with Walsall. Very hectic. Um, and, and <laughs> again, I think I think there we must we must give a, a bit of a kudos and credit to to your wife for putting up with with that because I can imagine there's a lot of time spent out the house. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, the good thing is she's also busy, so mm. that helps a bit. And the other thing that helps us is that at the moment we don't have any children. So that, that helps a lot. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, I think at some point when they come around, uh, I might need to change a few things. <laughs> Life will get that little bit busier somehow. Yeah. Well, be, before we, we, we head on to our sort of quick fire question round, I just want to ask, what, what advice would you give to any coaches listening to the podcast? You, you've been on an extraordinary journey and you know, and, and still continuing to do very well in that journey. What, what would you, if you could speak to a, an 18 year old one, what, what advice would you give to yourself? My first question is how much they love football. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's, 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 it's a tough, it's a tough environment in a good way, in a good way because it's really competitive. And mm -hmm. if you don't really love this game, you need to know if you are going to be able to cope with frustrations, with setbacks, 
uh, with all the things that might come before you really settle in a good way in this industry. Uh, networking, important, massive networking because that could be the difference between getting a role or not getting a role. Um, so be open with networking, find a way. And, and you need to be careful with networking because some people understand networking just asking for things. And, and when you network, you shouldn't be asking for. It's, 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 it's a two-way relationship. Uh, so you need to be careful when you are networking how you do it, how you approach people, especially when you don't know them well, because it, it, it might come the wrong way if you, yeah. if you, if you don't do it properly. Um, resilience, a strong mindset, because uh, I'm not saying other jobs are easier than coaching football because all the jobs are difficult in their way. Uh, but being outside on the pitch, one degree raining uh, with probably a grassroots team, it might not be a nice picture. But if you understand why you're doing it and if you understand why you are developed or how you are developing as a coach and how you are developing your players and you really love that and you have the strong mindset to say yes this is my my pathway the call the rain won't be a problem because you won't see that as a problem you won't you will see that as an opportunity to coach in a different environment um also uh, the the hours the hours that you put into this is is it's non-stop as, as a coach you don't stop because it's, it's not just the two hours that you deliver a session it's the hours you spend planning the session but also it's the hours you spend after the session thinking okay what did I do what I did well my reflection time how can I make things improve uh, how can I make these players improve the relationship with the players, relationship with the parents, depending on the age of the players. I mean, it's, it's non-stop receiving messages at three o'clock in the morning from some players. And, and or, I mean, you know, you know that, that the, the phone doesn't stop. It's, it's always a message, it's always a phone call, yeah. but that's the way it is. So that's why if you don't really love this game, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tougher than if you really love the game. So for me, that's the best. That's the first question. How much do you love this? If you love it, go, go for it. Go for it because I think there are a lot of rewards at the end of the journey. Yeah. No, superb advice. What, what does the future hold for you then? One, what, what, where do you want to be in 12 months if we have another conversation apart from healthy and through this well, yes, exactly. If, well, uh, I think now short term is a lot of applications for the A license. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is my my priority right now to try to get into the A license uh, course, um, and and keep developing as a coach. I mean. Uh, all obviously, do I want a full-time role in football? Yes, and and, and 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 probably that is the answer that any coach that is part-time trying to get into this industry will tell you. Yes, I want a full-time role. Uh, but if it's not there, I'm more than happy to carry on with four roles. <laughs> so, so the main thing is, is is keep working hard, keep keep chasing the dream. And, and that's it, really. Superb, mate. Superb. It's been it's been great chatting, and, and it's where now I get to put you on the spot a little bit, and you, you maybe get to dig a few few former colleagues out or <laughs> chuck them under the bus. Um, so the first question of the quick fire question is: Who's the best coach you've seen work? 
oh, without a doubt, Paul McGuinness. Amazing, amazing. The passion, the knowledge, the, the, the way he talks, the way he, he inspires people is, is, is amazing. It's amazing. It's, it's, I've been, I, I probably watched him three, four times coaching and I, I love every, every single time I have watched him coaching. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Who's, who's your best friend in football? <laughs> uh, I would say Steve Barrow. He was a, the first team manager at Sporting Calza Women when I just finished my level two. And I was trying to get into, um, into a senior football but there wasn't anything available in, in men's football at that moment. There was this, this chance to get into women's football. Uh, and I got there and I, I, he has been a, a massive friend since, since day one. Uh, we, we click really well together. Uh, unfortunately, we don't work anymore together, but we, we, we talk every, almost every single week uh, about the, the things that each of us are doing. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Without a doubt, him. Okay. Who's been your toughest opponent as a coach? Uh, this one was a tough one because uh, obviously in academy football you don't see other coaches as opponents. Really, it's it's more mm -hmm. about the the players and and developing them. So, uh, if probably I would say uh, Nimesh Patel, he's the Leicester. Uh, University of Leicester uh, first team uh, manager and we played three games against each other last season in the in the University League and probably he has been a guy who has made me think how to approach each game in a different way mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and also we, we record the games we had a uh, Anal analysis sessions with the players, how we could do things better. Uh, so yeah, I, I think him. He he's a, and he is a smart guy. He's a smart guy. Uh, how he changed their their approach in each game. Who's been the best player you've coached then? <laughs> uh, I, I I cannot point out only one to be honest. Uh, I think. Uh, ben Osher, he was our player at Bolmer St. Michael's, step five, non-league football. And after that year, he signed for Solihull Moors. Uh, he's a superb lad, not, all, not only as a player, as a person, amazing. And, and, I, and I think he, he, will, he will get higher than he is right now. Uh, then Owen Parry. He was also a player at Bolmer uh, in that year. Um, he's uh, still there, but uh, he shouldn't be there. He shouldn't be way higher, uh, in a higher level, because he's a quality player, quality person, always keen to learn, still young. So, yeah, he's, he's amazing to coach, really. And then I need to pick someone from uni. Uh, James Bot Flower, who is the keeper. Oh mate, he's 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 so professional. That is is amazing, and uh, he's also the captain of the of the team this year. And how he inspires the other players to be there, how he keeps a professional environment in the team is amazing. It's amazing. It, it makes your life way easier as a manager because you got that person that is always with the players but with the same mentality as you as a coach. So, yeah, yeah, I would say those three. What's been your best moment in football to date? Um, winning the Warsaw Senior Cup with Bolmer uh, in the 2018-2019 season, yeah. The, the match was played at Best Cut Stadium, Warsaw, and we won against Sutton Caulfield. 
2 0. They were, well, they, they are a team in a league above us. And um, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, amazing, amazing experience. What's been your biggest wow moment? <laughs> well, they, I would say three football related. One, meeting Roberto Carlos. Uh, that was in Madrid, just walking around, and I just saw him <laughs> there, wow. and he and he was really friendly. He 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 just chat with me for with for five minutes, took a picture with me. R really amazing guy. Uh, then having the chance to go and watch Boca Juniors against River play at La Bombonera, and with Maradona on his private box in the stadium. Wow. Uh, yeah, amazing. The environment, uh, is, 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 it was crazy. And I'm probably, as a player, even though I don't have a, a career in, as a player, is playing the, is something similar to the um, um, food, um, school football cup, something similar, but it was uh, broadcasted live in in TV and, and we won the, the title. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Superb. Superb. Who's been your biggest role model or influence in football? From I, I need to choose someone that is from Venezuela and a, probably one of the best coaches that we have had in the national team and in the local tournament. His name is Richard Pais. Uh, and and he's also a doctor, doctor qualified. Uh, so right. a, re a really smart guy, really smart guy. He used to play professional football. And the best era of the Venezuelan national team was under him. Uh, a really gentleman. Uh, someone that he really wanted to make a positive change in football in general in Venezuela. And he was achieving that. Uh, and then I would tell Raúl from Real Madrid. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, his career was perfect, not even a cent off during his whole career. A true gentleman. And if you see him now coaching and you see the, the, the team that plays under him, you see the same values that he, mm -hmm. he was as a coach. And I think that's important as, as coaches to try to transmit those those values as a as a person to your players as well. Uh, I, I think he's a, a fantastic role model for any player or any coach. Superb. Yeah. This has been probably the most difficult one. As describe yourself in three words. <laughs> uh, passionate. Uh, resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, and dreamer. I like that. And final question. Is there anybody you would recommend or like to hear on the podcast? Uh, 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 yes, I mean, uh, Rod Williams would be a nice one, but he was already in the podcast. Um, after meeting uh, Steve Sidwell in the AYA course, I think he's a, a fantastic person to have in the podcast. I think he has amazing experiences playing on the Mourinho, playing Premier League, playing Championship, uh, now coaching at Brighton Academy, he pundit. So I, I think he, he could be a massive, a massive uh, guest for the podcast. I will, uh, I will press, put the pressure on again and, <laughs> and see if we can get him on. I know he's a very busy man. Um, just like yourself but one look, I can't thank you enough for, for giving me an hour and a half of your time today it's been a pleasure to, to listen to you speak I, I always enjoy speaking to you when we, when we do meet up at, at local events me too, mate. To, to, to have 90 minutes with you and, and talk about your story is, is really inspiring mate and, and I'm sure that many many others will will take the same feelings um, from this episode so here at PCT mate we want to wish you all the best in in, in your roles that you've got today, I'm sure you'll absolutely smash them. And, and you, you know, we wish you all the best and hope you and your wife stay safe and, and the rest of your family. Thank you, mate. The same for you and your family. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Top man, anytime. Speak soon, buddy.
Yeah, they do. Hello, we are Tal Central UK. Local Tal stock is here on Trentham Trade Park, Stanley Matthews Way. Our opening hours are 8 till 5 in the week and Saturdays till 12. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy the content that we're trying to bring to you. Don't forget, new episodes will be released every Monday. You can find us on the iTunes Store, Spotify, and if you want to see the video, you can see it on our YouTube channel, PCT Football Coaching.